He has entertained us for years, creating some of the big screen's most memorable characters in such films as The Producers, Willy Wonka, Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, Silver Streak, and The Woman in Red. He made headlines with his romance and marriage to comedian Gilda Radner and then supported her through her much-publicized battle with cancer. Today, happily remarried, he continues to promote cancer awareness and works both in the film industry and as a best-selling author. Hello, I'm Ernie Manoos. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with movie legend Gene Wilder. I think you know that I was Jerry Silberman, right? right? And um, I had just gotten into the actor's studio, which was a, a big thrill for me. And I didn't want to be introduced as Jerry Silberman. I couldn't picture Jerry Silberman in Hamlet or Macbeth or something like that. And I had to think of a name overnight. And um, my sister and brother-in-law had a friend who's the fastest talker I've ever met. He started with A and worked his way up through the alphabet. When he got to W, he said, Wilder. And I said, that's the one I want. And then for the first name, it was because of uh, Thomas Wolfe's books, uh, the Look Homeward Angel. And the hero's name was Eugene, but everyone called him Gene, who loved him. And The Web and the Rock, and You Can't Go Home Again. It was always Gene. So I put the two together, and then I was introduced by Lee Strasberg as Gene Wilder. Because there, Ely Kazan and Shelley Winters and Rod Steiger and Paul Newman and uh, I didn't want them to say, Jerry, what's your name, Jerry or Gene or yeah. you know, what? So that's how it started. But, but do you get used to it? No, I'm you? very used to it. Now if someone said Jerry, I probably wouldn't turn around. Unless it was my sister. Yeah. <laughs> does she still call Sometimes you she does. <laughs> Jer, Jerry, yeah. but she's the only one. When you decided to write your autobiography, is that a scary moment? I'd been asked to write uh, maybe three times in the previous 15, 18 years, and I said, maybe one day, but I'm not ready for it. And then um, I went to California with my wife, Karen, and her mom, who I was very close with, my mother-in-law, and we were going to go for two weeks or three weeks, I forget which, and my mother-in-law got deathly ill and had to have an operation and we were there for two months and I thought if I don't start doing something artistic I'm going to go crazy so I started writing down all the ironies in my life good and bad that led to something else and I said that's the structure I've been looking for for my memoir and I wanted to confine it just to my search for love and art and once I started, after the first 18 pages, I was convinced that I had the structure that I needed. So I talk about some films, some people, but only if they're related to what I was looking for. Right. Well, how did you decide how, and I, I know this sounds strange, but how honest to be? Because it's a very honest account. Yeah, it's a good question. And it's one I asked myself at the beginning. And I said, if I'm not going to be completely honest, there's no point in writing this because I wasn't interested in doing a tell-all book. And um, I didn't want to hurt one or two people's feelings, so I told part of the truth, but not all, because I had been married and had an adopted daughter, and I didn't want to go into some things. But um, I said, if you're not honest, then don't write the book. That was an easy decision. Easier, harder writing fiction or nonfiction for you? Oh, well. So the first book was nonfiction, and I'm not making a joke now. <laughs> 38 years ago, I was in Paris making one of my first films. I was alone, I was lonely, and I had an idea for 
a movie. Um, I said, well, when you get back home, write it as a screenplay. And I did. And it was a rotten screenplay. <laughs> it was my first one. But the story was very good. And after I had written Kiss Me Like a Stranger, uh, I, I wanted to write again, right away. And I remembered that, that story, and I started writing it as a novel. It's a short one. It's a novella. And everything poured out in the right order this time. Yeah. And um, that's how it came out. It, uh, came about. It's easier in some ways to write a memoir or autobiography. Uh, in other ways, it's more difficult because you're going into such personal things. With fiction, you're making it all up so you can talk about what you wish. Even though I've written my third book now too, but I, we're not <laughs> going to talk about that. But part of me comes out in the fiction book. I'm, even though the character's name is something else, and it, First World War, 1918, the trenches in France, and then going to Germany and posing as a, a spy, still a lot of it of, is me going into that character. Um, I wouldn't. I don't try to distinguish as I'm writing it, but I realize that a lot of the things are going in that are from me. Do you approach the characterization in a novel differently than preparing for a film role? Yes. Um, in the film role, I concentrate mostly on physical actions and emotional situations because I, I'm, I'm not very good if I'm not emotional. I mean, I'm just trying to be honest with you. Yeah. There's 14 other guys who could act a straight role better than I could. I'd be all right as number 15, but, <laughs> um, but if it's emotional, comedy and emotional, I would be good. And so I just think about what can I do, not imitating anyone else, but just what motor can I set off in me that will get me cooking. Uh, in writing a book, I think about what was she wearing, what was he wearing, what did the room look like, what is he going through, what is he thinking about, and also emotional things, but it's quite a different story writing about all the background to it and what the thoughts are. When a movie camera comes in on you, you can tell that someone is thinking something deep, but you don't hear it. In the book, you have to hear it, if the author chooses to have you hear it. Is writing a novel then similar to directing? In some ways, it is, yeah, except the actors are easier. <laughs> <laughs> because if I don't like them, I just cross them out. <laughs> a director can't, can't do that to actors. Unless you fire the actor, which has happened a lot with, not with me, but with... Uh, Oh, for instance, in Catch-22, Mike Nichols had someone in mind for something, and it didn't work out, and the person was gone. It paid for, but gone. It happens. He also did the same thing with Robert De Niro in George Washington Slept Here. It wasn't working out. He wasn't being, getting the funny performance that he wanted. And, and they never did that film, either. They just canceled the whole thing. So a director has a tough job in that way. What do you like best? Writing, directing, acting? Uh, at the beginning, I started acting at 13. Right. At the beginning, it was acting. I didn't think about writing. Then after the first two movies, I started thinking about writing screenplays. Uh, right now, I would rather write fiction than act. Really, why? Well, boy, that's a corker, what you're asking. <laughs> um, when you're acting, you want to prove to the audience that you're worthwhile, that you're a good actor, that you're hoping it comes across, that it'll be a great success. When you're writing by yourself, you don't have to prove anything, because if you don't like it, just rip it up, throw it away, start a different idea or book. But when you're acting, you're in the spotlight all the time. Especially, I mean, if you have a leading role and um, 
I don't want to have to prove that I'm a, a good actor anymore. I'm, I am what I am as an actor, and uh, I've done some good films. I've done some that didn't turn out well, although I always thought that they would. Uh, I, may, I mean, Blazing Saddles, uh, Young Frankenstein, the producers, Willy Wonka, a couple with uh, Richard Pryor, The Frisco Kid and The Woman in Red, those are all, I think, good movies. But um, they're not being offered to me now. And I'm, I, I don't want to start writing one of those. Uh, although I did write the screenplay for My French Whore uh, because a producer wanted to make it as a movie, and so we'll see. But um, how, well, I'm going to stop here for just yeah. one minute and ask, how different was the screenplay this time than the first time you wrote it? Well, a screenplay, you're, it's uh, visual image after visual image. Hitchcock stopped going to movies, he said, because he was tired of watching photographs of people talking. <laughs> and in a screenplay, it's all what you're seeing. It's moving pictures. Not talk, it can be talking as well, but it's moving pictures. Um, so the screenplay is different in that regard, but the story is the same. But I mean to the original screenplay you wrote back 30-some odd years the ago. The essential plot is the same. Uh, th that's what drove it. But the actual screenplay is nothing like this one. Um, but the story is basically the same. It's much better now. Why do you think you got into acting? I would have put money that you were going to ask me that. Ah, <laughs> oh, well then I shouldn't have asked. No, no, it's not <laughs> bad. It's, no, it's good. It's, um, I'll tell you, that there's two answers. One is I don't know, and the other is um, I think I wanted to be listened to and watched because I wasn't getting that kind of attention when my mother was so ill since my earliest days. And, um, and when I started acting at 13, I was getting a kind of attention that I didn't get before. Because I was basically pretty shy. I still am, in a lot of ways. But I started it when I saw my sister. I was 11 when I saw my sister do a recital. 200 people talking noisily. The lights were on in the small auditorium, and then the lights went out. Psh, 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 psh. Then you could hear a pin drop. A spotlight hit the center of the curtain, and my sister walked out in this lavender gown. And for 20 minutes, she did this monologue. And I thought that's as close to being God as I imagined you could get to be. And I went up to her teacher afterwards. I said, can I study with you? And he said, how old are you? I said, 11. He said, come back to me when you're 13, if you still want to, and I'll take you on. And I went back to him when I was 13, and I started studying. Did now, becoming a star ruin the magic of it for you in some way? No, it helped, really? oddly enough, because if anyone is watching this program, and I'm sure they are. I hope so. <laughs> and if any of them want to be actors, that includes actresses, you should know that it's nothing but rejection. And maybe 4 or 5% get past that, survive it emotionally, because it's really rough. And then, you, I mean, you can make a living with commercials, doing TV now and everything, but when you start out, it's just rejection after rejection. And unless you want it so badly that you'll continue on anyway, you're not going to make it. It's crazy. There's something nutty in you that's driving, a driving force. In me, I think it was because something was missing in my own makeup, my own psyche, and, and I felt when I was on stage, because I, I only did stage work until Bonnie and Clyde, um, I was freer than I was in real life. 
Do you remember the first moment seeing yourself on the screen? The first time I saw Bonnie and Clyde, um, I was surprised, but it, it was a very short scene, you know, it was short two scenes, but they were good. But I was nervous doing it, uh, and I was in the studio one day for the interiors inside the car when the barrel gang is chasing us. And um, Arthur Penn, the director, said, action. And I jumped in right away. He said, wait, wait, Gene. I can see you're not ready yet. Just because I say action doesn't mean you have to start. It means we're ready. So when you're ready, you start. And the scene went very well. And the assistant director came up to me afterwards and said, don't expect that from another director. There aren't many like Arthur Penn. And he was right. It was good. But I had a small part. But when you have a bigger part, especially if you have a leading role, you don't have to worry so much about people saying, don't do this and do that, because you have actually too much control. And some hotshot actors think that they can control the whole set and what the schedule is going to be, and I will, I won't, I want to change this. But it, especially the stage actors, if you come up, the director is the boss and should be. Right. What's it like working with Mel Brooks? Well, <laughs> funny you should ask. <laughs> funny. <laughs> uh, heaven on a stick. Really? Yeah. Um, he's making jokes and making people laugh all the time if there's more than two people in the crowd. If it's just the two of you together, he's not like that. Um, we did The Producers, which was his first film, and with Zero, and Zero Mustel, and it was wonderful. Um, Blazing Saddles, it was fun, but I didn't have that big a part. He wanted me to play Harvey Corman's part, Hedley Lamar, and I said, well, oh, I'm not right for that, Mel, and then he had a lot of trouble with two actors, and he called me from the set and said, can you come tomorrow and get on the plane, and I was supposed to go to do The Little Prince in London. And he said, call up Stanley Don and tell him, switch it around. And let. So <laughs> I did, and I switched it around. And a day later, I was upside down in the jail cell. <laughs> and Young Frankenstein, which I wrote, was, uh, was, I wrote with Mel, but only the second, third, and fourth draft, we worked on things. But he would come in at 7.30 or 8 at night, see what I'd written, and then talk about we don't have a villain. You, the Burgermeister is not the villain. You've got to make a villain. And I said, you mean someone like K Inspector Kemp uh, who sticks darts into his wood? And I, yeah, that would be a good villain. And, like <laughs> that. Um, Do you like to collaborate? I haven't done it much. Um, you mean with Mel? Yeah. In the, in the making of the movie? In or the making of the movie, in, in your art alone. Do you... Do you enjoy the collaborative process, or is that something you'd like to create on your own? I like to create it on my own, but, but if you're talking about a director directing me, no, that's a different thing. And when Mel has actors he knows and loves and can trust, like Madeleine Kahn, Terry Garr, Cloris Leachman, Marty Feldman, Gene Wilder, Kenny Mars, he doesn't have to do anything. He just says, go. He doesn't say action. He says, go. <laughs> but if he has an actor who he doesn't know and, and he's having trouble with him, he starts giving line readings. And that's anathema. Because then the actor tries to imitate what Mel did. And you don't get any real life from that. But he knows that. So when he has actors he knows, it, it is heaven. Can the chemistry change a film? And I. I guess obviously yes, but what I'm talking about is when you have a group like you had on Young Frankenstein mm -hmm. and you're enjoying the work you're doing, the finished product comes out a certain way, can you, could you have come out with the same film if there hadn't been that, that fun, that friendship on the set? It wouldn't be as good, but if the script is good, chances are it would be a good film. If the script is not good and you have a great director and, and great actors, it's not going to be a good film. It, the script is really... I can't say everything, 
but I would say it's 55-60% uh, of everything. How do you feel when you see works that you've done before coming alive again, such as The Producers Became the Musical, uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Willy Wonka, a new version came out, for Young Frankenstein, ready to be redone. Do you like that or not? Um, I was nervous about the producers. Uh, Karen and I, my wife and I, were, uh, Mel wanted me to see a preview before it opened, and we went and my heart was going pretty fast until Nathan Lane got that first big laugh and I settled down and I said, this is not the same. This is a, this is a new animal. It's a Broadway musical and it was wonderful. And I love that, so there, no conflict with that at all. Um, Willy Wonka, when I heard that, uh, what's his name? Tim Burton. Tim Burton was going to write it and direct it. I thought this is going to be a dark film. Maybe a good one, but a dark one. But the thing that put me off, I like Johnny Depp. I like, as an actor, I like him very much. But when I saw little pieces uh, in the promotion of what he was doing, I said, I don't want to see the film because I, I don't want to be disappointed in him. So that was, I put that out of my mind. Young Frankenstein, I tried to talk Mel out of doing. Really? Yeah, because, uh, for instance, Putting on the Ritz was a showstopper. One musical number. The Creature and I, in Top Hat and Tails, doing Irving Berlin's Putting on the Ritz. He was going to do, he is going to do, a musical that needs 18 to 22 musical numbers, singing and dancing. That's a, another animal. That's a different thing. And um, he's more of a Borscht Belt comic. That's where he came from. I'm not like that. It'll say, based on a screenplay by Gene Wilder and Mel Brooks, but the musical is Mel Brooks and um, Tommy Meehan. Uh, and um, I didn't want to see him... I wanted to see him happy at this point in his life. I just wanted him to be happy. If it fails, then no one's going to blame me. If it's a great success, I'll get credit for something <laughs> and uh, five bucks extra. Yeah. But as long as he's happy, I'll be happy with it. Now, you've, you've mentioned your wife a few times, Karen. A lot of people... I wish she were here today. Oh, I wish she were, I want, too. I would like you to have met her. <laughs> a lot of people... I'm still in love with her, by the way. Yeah, We've been well, married 15 years. See, and that's the point I want to bring up. A lot of people have you frozen in time with Gilda Radner. Mm -hmm. I understand why. Is that hard for you and Karen when there's that kind of legacy? At the sense? beginning. Not now. Yeah. No. Especially after I wrote Kiss Me Like a Stranger, uh, those who read it would see the difficulties that... I mean, Gilda and I did a film together. It wasn't a good film. I thought it was going to be Hanky Panky. And we got married in 1984. She got cancer in 1986, and she died in 1989. And from, the, from 1986 on, my life was based on portable toilets and vomit and keeping her happy. And I did believe with all my heart that she was going to pull through and survive. I was an idiot. But it's a good thing I did believe that because she'd say, I know that you would never have said that to me if you thought I was going to die. And... Uh, it was very difficult, but then came the Gilda's Clubs, which Joanna Bull and I and Joel Siegel started, and now they're all over the country and in London, and uh, ironies, one thing leading to another. I was very unhappy for a long while with Gilda, and I'm happier now than I've ever been in my life. And at the beginning, people would come up to me and say, oh, you're, you poor you fellow, and we love your wife. We loved your wife. And I say, I'm married now, you know, to, oh, yeah, that's right. Well, good luck, and I hope you're happy. That was at the very beginning. Yeah. Now that's not a problem. And Karen never met Gilda, which I think 
Well, may or may not have made it easier, but for me, in some ways, it was easier that she hadn't, because she cared about her and helped mm, guild his clubs and everything. No, it's not a problem now. Karen and you seem to find what makes it work as far as a relationship oh, goes. Yeah. What was the key, do you think, to this relationship working so well for you? Well, part of it was the timing, because if it had happened 20 years earlier, I don't think it would have happened. I, I wasn't ready. I don't know if Karen would have been ready or not, but I certainly wasn't. But at the time that we met, it was like I didn't think I'd ever get married again. And uh, I didn't believe in fate either. I always felt you'd make your own life and then call it fate. With Karen, It's okay. I do believe in fate. Well, I am happy that you are so happy. Thank you. And all the joy you've brought all of us through all the years. Thank you so much. Thank you. Gene Wilder. Thank you. To order a DVD of this or any episode of interviews, please visit HoustonPBS.org.